that's the Hollywood part. I've seen uh, helicopters crash on tarmacs and different things, and I haven't seen one explode. Hey, my name is Dakota Brody. I'm a 21-year military veteran. I served 13 years in the U.S. Coast Guard as a search and rescue helicopter pilot, and eight years in the Army as a UH-60 Black Hawk helicopter pilot. Today, we're gonna look at helicopter rescue scenes in movies and judge how real they are. All right, tuck them in, boys. For the Coast Guard, primarily, we face offshore and going offshore is to affect most of our rescues. However, the Coast Guard does train for uh, vertical surface rescues, which is what you're seeing right here. Cliff side, cliff rescues, and everything else. To stay perfectly still, I have to stabilize the car, okay? Sorry. Car secured. Ah! <laughs> All right, if that is the hoist hook, you are in what you call a committed situation. Every Hilo pilot, would be shaken at this point right now, knowing that the hoist hook is attached to a vehicle that could fall off. Not happening, we're not connecting up to any vehicle. Joby, I'm coming down. Harrison, you're flying. So, a pilot going to the back seat. First of all, you know how much stuff you can knock off? You could literally turn off both of your engines. The fact that your vest and everything could snag and you could flip things off. We've actually had a person turn with their MVGs sitting on top of their head and actually hit one of the engines and knock an engine offline with that. So yeah, it's very possible to actually turn off something inadvertently, just climbing, trying to get to the back of the cabin. Out the door. Natalie, don't you worry, I'm gonna get you out. If I am outside the helicopter, we have a real bad problem. As a pilot, I am never outside. I got you. They were trying to show like the hoist was holding the truck up, right? The hoist that you have on there about 600 pounds. So it's not your primary means of holding up anything. At that point that it was smoking, it was straining so hard. Now there is a squib that you could flip the switch to actually cut and shear that hoist cable, which is what they were doing at that point. So somehow they sheared the one cable and the rock and the other person was on a different cable. I don't know what that is. I'll say that our helicopter has one cable that we're gonna operate with. Once that cable gets sheared, everything's going down with it. It's not gonna happen on so many different levels on this clip. This right here is a zero. Where are they? Tanker's on the way. Air Force Rescue, two, three, one. I don't know why nobody wears MVGs. Everybody has MVGs on, night vision goggles on in the helicopters, nobody wears them. If you have the option of having them on, yeah, you're gonna have them on. The fuel probe that you just saw, that's not a standard piece of equipment on helicopters. It's just certain helicopters that are either doing some long range rescues. Most helicopters do not have that. Your biggest thing at that point is if you miss where's that tube that's going that's flowing fuel, if you're gonna cut that thing with the main rotor, you're talking about damage to the main rotor system, you'd be in a bad spot at that point. Looking right now at a lightning strike, a knock on wood, and thank God I've never had that happen, you risk frying a lot of electronics, engine control systems that are on there, you're hoping that your engines are staying online, you would probably lose a lot of electronic AC and DC systems inside the helicopter. But you should be able to keep flying unless you got hit in like the tail rotor or something. Every year the Coast Guard has to do what's called dunker training. So we get flipped over in a chair in a pool, which simulates having to ditch. You're rolled upside down. You have to do multiple different egresses to show that you have the proficiency to be able to get out of a submerged helicopter every single year. And then every six years, if, unless they've changed it, but every six years you would go to actual school where you go through the whole mock-up simulator of a device going in and rolling over. So this is a part of the business. He's got C's bottle or a Heed's bottle, which gives you about two to three minutes at normal breath. In that mode right there, you have about 10 to 15 seconds if they're breathing the way I think they are. But the pure shock of going in and the water temperature itself is going to take the breath out of you. 
but I do like the realistic aspect of seeing somebody grab that seize bottle and put that thing in their mouth. Now, for everybody that flies, we have emergency jettison handles. So the normal exits are no longer going to get you out of the door. It's too much pressure that's on that door at that point. So you're literally hitting your emergency jettison like it's blowing cartridge and the door pops off. It just is lifting up the actual door hinge pins out of the way. So you can have a create that full opening at that point. Anybody that's going for that, yeah, you're going to die. I give this one probably about a six. You can lower me down. I'll get the two men. You return and pick us up on my signal. The theatrics on there is amazing. They had no business being that close to a rig that's exploding. We've done uh, multiple rescues in the Gulf of Mexico. That's where I was stationed at before. So flying out to rigs. Rigs typically have burn-offs happening, but there's always either gases or stuff like that that's coming off. So the rigs all have more of a escape type pods and things for the rig workers to be able to get out and be able to get off of the rigs. And then we would affect the rescue from the open water. To try to go into there again, we're no good to anybody. And it's so much risk of that flying debris, shrapnel going through the rotor blade system. You're just now a victim. You're not gonna put yourself or the crew in that situation. Down five. Any standard deployment of the rescue swimmer, they're just going down. At that point, you just call it a direct deployment of the rescue swimmer, especially when you're deploying somebody either to a boat that's underway. You'll have them down, you'll have them just off the water or just above. But to say that you're about to send somebody through a flame, <laughs> a blowtorch in essence, not gonna happen. One. When somebody is on the cable, the hook is actually locked just to prevent any mishap to where it could inadvertently come open. For somebody to pirouette and unhook themselves off of the cable at the same time, that's pretty amazing. Nobody would be that crazy to even attempt to put somebody in that situation. The rescue swimmer would come up and slap everybody in the helicopter. <laughs> We're even putting them down and something like that. So absolutely not. It's completely unrealistic. That's a zero. When he jumps from the helicopter, that's a free fall deployment of the rescue swimmer. That is reserved for daytime only. So we would have only hoisted the rescue swimmer down at that point, not let him jump from the helicopter. They're seeing like 20 foot swells or something like that. That means the helicopter is hovering at least 30 to 40 feet. You misjudge that swell, that's a four or five story drop. That water turns into a solid real quick, <laughs> especially at those cold temperatures. It's a standard rescue basket. He's calling for the basket, has a ready for pickup sign. That's exactly what you would hear because we're standing by keeping our light in the direction of the swimmer, kind of making sure we always have sight on them. And as they're getting ready, you're going to try to place the device really within about five to 10 feet of them once they're calling for it. So very, very real. Are we looking on fuel there? Bingo, we're at bingo. Gotta go. We're out of time. We gotta go, call. So that bingo fuel, that's a real term. It just means like if you leave now, you will land with a fuel reserve when you get back at your station. Anything that's less than there, you can be at risk of either not making it to your destination or airport or flaming out. It's always a race against how much fuel you have. When you're seeing the winds, that rotor wash, it's beating down on you. It's a mini hurricane underneath it. There's no communicating with the swimmer in the water at that point in time, all hand arm signals. That would be insane to think that you're gonna hear a person, a swimmer in the water underneath a spinning helicopter. Not gonna happen on there. The waves out there, that's in like the Arctic kind of where I believe that scene was taking place. 20, 30 foot seas and even having rogue waves can happen, but you try to be above that. The explosion, that's the Hollywood part. I've seen uh, helicopters crash on tarmacs and different things and I haven't seen one explode. Even in the army, I saw one take a SA-7 and hit the engine out. That was the only one I saw that was on fire. I would give it a seven. It's a Coast Guard. They must have picked up the distress call. Somewhere's ready. Plus 
swimmer. So far right now, you're seeing pretty much a legitimate helicopter rescue. It's daytime, you can free fall the swimmer in daytime. Their altitude was good where the swimmer could safely go out. The swimmer is going to have their goggles, everything down, and they're going to free fall with their gear up. They go in the water, they're going to lose all their gear. So they're going down, they're going to cover their mask and everything as it's going in. The device going down and being placed about five feet from them in the water, that's just textbook Coast Guard rescue swimmer operations on there. When you have Baywatch, that's really the LA County's fire department. They're AKA Baywatch here in the Los Angeles area. We hoist with them routinely. The rescue swimmer could easily just bring them over to the vessel. The fire department, they're trained paramedics as well. Primarily, you're gonna to try to put people in with the least risky rescue method, which would be to put them on the boat. Unless they had sustained something else that they needed immediate transport, or bring them in a helicopter and transport them to the nearest hospital. But the rescue in itself, that's pretty textbook for what you could see if you're going to free fall the rescue swimmer. Yes. It's a nine just because of how the rescue swimmer had his goggles and stuff on top of his head. I love the precision flying of that. This is the MH-68 or AW-109, the Stingray. Really what you'll call for Hitron, which is our helicopters tactics interdiction. It's a specialized unit that, that we have that primarily their focus is interdicting either drug smugglers or anything else like that in, in international waters. Mostly dealing with drug smuggling, what you'll call a go fast. They'll typically outrun a boat. Your normal cruise is somewhere around like the 120 to 130, 130 knots. If you're really got like a good tailwind and stuff like that. Watch out, he got a weapon on board. Hell out. I've never been at Hitron. I did fly uh, airborne use of force with the Coast Guard. A lot of times what you're trying to do is we're going to try to stay outside of what they have on the on board of there and make sure we can at least maximize the use of our weapon systems. Coast Guard, take them down. They went for the kill shots right there. So normally they're going to probably put some stitches in the water they say stitches in the water because when you see it it looks like stitches from the machine gun being going out and that's kind of just to escalate the level of the use of force at that point before they try to shoot the engines out and really are more so trying to just disable the vessel that's primarily what they're doing at is disabling the vessel so i give them about a seven at any point in time <laughs> You're committed. You have something that's attached to something that can pull you down. That's just the worst situation for a helicopter, right? So you're just at the mercy of being on that pivot point and just completely helpless. Wet, slippery hand conditions, trying to hold on to a ladder with adrenaline and the amount of rotor wash. It's a mini hurricane down there. So you're holding on with a, quite a bit of grip. So I'm pretty sure you're almost probably bear hugging the ladder at any point just to try to maintain your grip. We're gonna stall. Cut it now. Give it a job. We're gonna die here. I said cut it. Oh, they were actually doing well talking as a crew for saying get rid of it. That's a tough call. It sounds easy to watch the movie and say that, but that is a really hard call to say is sheer. Even when we're getting ready to start any hoists and rescues, like, hey, if this happens, they'll say sheer three times safety pilot or, something, or the flight mech, you race for that shear button. It was an eight for how dynamic that environment would be. The stretcher, we call it a litter. Anytime we're gonna use a litter, we're gonna use a trail line to help stabilize because that flat plane surface that's underneath with all the rotor wash that's down below will really have a good propensity to have somebody start spinning really quick. I'm not sure what was causing the pilot to struggle so much. He's got the whole ship to look at as far as in reference. Power really wasn't an issue. It almost looked like they were making the hoist cable feel like it was somehow taking power away from the engines. I don't know. Having a fouled cable or watching the cable actually birdcage 
that part is real. That can happen. So it could go in there and not be, you can't let out some more cable at that point. I don't understand why the pilot was struggling so bad. I'm not sure at this point what's got a hold of them. It's some good bait that's clearly under there for whatever is eating on them. So there's no need to take the whole helicopter down. Sheer, sheer, sheer. We'll have to preserve the lives of the rest of the crew. There's nothing else you could do. This is more of, of a three. Please don't shoot the flare at the helicopter. We see the flare in the distance. Trust us, the flare gets on the raft, it'll start eating through. It's like a phosphorus material. So you're shooting like hot phosphorus at the thing that's trying to rescue you. You're trying to take us down with you at that point in time. The flare is meant to be seen, not to be caught. We just want to see the flare go up and then find the point of origin so we could come in and affect the rescues. A lot of times if we're going out, it's more likely just one helicopter. I'm not saying you can't have two. If it's a longshore rescue as well, there's a fixed wing asset overhead that will probably go out and do really good radar sweeps inside of the area and try to help us. And they'll also be able to drop and deliver any type of rescue materials. Certain helicopters do have radar systems. So we're trying to either see a blip on the radar or we're trying to map the shoreline when we're out there in really poor weather conditions. Helicopters have a few different lights, so each pilot have their own searchlight, and then a lot of times you'll operate with what's called the night sun. So it's just a really powerful searchlight towards the middle or the back of the cabin. This right here is probably a 9.5. Favorite one that I've seen so far is, is probably the Guardian. It captures the essence. They are consummate professionals, and they understand that at any point they can be left there. Hey, if you like this type of video, click above to see some more.